everything already? Test color. No, I want to do that. You, you got it. Go for it. All right. What's up, guys? I'm KBHD here, and welcome to another, uh, I guess, a slightly unusual video. But so just to give a little context on what's going on here, just shot a video with StarTalk, and it went pretty well. You should go and check it out. I'll probably have a link in the description below. But I figured while I'm here with Neil and Chuck, might as well get a little interview in since it's only fair since you did interview me about two years ago. Uh, we should uh, reverse roles a little bit. I'll talk to you for a little bit. Good to see you again. Yeah, good to see yes, you again yes. too, mm -hmm. by the way. Mm -hmm. um, You're maturing nicely. You were like 14 or something. I was, I was pretty young and I feel like that was definitely a big part of what we talked about, but <laughs> I've seen a lot since then were, and it's gone pretty well. In fact, you were 12 well. years old, I'm pretty I was sure. basically an infant. But yeah, so this is, this is going to be fun. I think the thing that was on my mind just when I had the opportunity to ask you anything uh, is just from a, an astrophysicist perspective, I mean, we look at the tech that we have on the palm of our hands every day and it's, it's pretty sweet. It's, you know, new phones, new tablets. But a lot of that comes from the higher end, the, the military technology, the space program technology. A lot of things eventually trickle their way down into what we're able to hold in our hands. Are there things that you guys have seen or heard of that maybe we don't know about that's on its way that might end up in our phones or tablets or handheld someday? I'm not authorized to. <laughs> <laughs> if I tell you. <laughs> uh, why don't I, uh, I have some ideas, but I'm not very good at predicting the future. Sure. And I have ev good evidence that I'm not good at predicting the future. And I've told this many times, Chuck, when I'm old enough to remember Star Trek in first run. Okay. My parents did too. Oh, your parents did. <laughs> and so there's the warp drives and the photon torpedoes and, the, and this machine where you put in a card and then hot food comes out instantly. This was an extraordinary view of the future. And I said, yeah, yeah, that's all going to happen. And there was one thing about Star Trek that I could not imagine. And it, it took the realism of Star Trek out of it for me. And that was the fact that they could just walk up to a door and the door would open. I said, how does the door know? It can't know that they're there. Okay, they're over here and now they're there and it opens. And for some reason, the warp drives and the photon torpedoes and the transporters were all believable to me, Pardon. but not the auto opening door. Automatic doors is where you drew the line. I had to, that, I, I was, I. Oh, so this is all literally before any automatic doors. <laughs> Okay, so that's why I wouldn't trust my sense of the future here. But I do want to give you an acute appreciation for how the past became the future. All right, so let's go back 100 years. The dawn of our understanding of the atom. Now, how does the atom work? I don't know, let's probe it. We start probing it in the 1920s through particle accelerators and experiments. Out of this comes quantum physics, the quantum. On top of that, Albert Einstein says, hmm, using what we know about quantum physics and using what we know about this kind of physics, I can put them together, calculate. I've come up with a new thing that would occur in atoms. It's called the stimulated emission of radiation. Okay? No one paid any attention to that paper. It was interesting. It advanced quantum physics. But if you had lawmakers and politicians and people saying, why doesn't that help me today? Why are you doing research that has nothing to do with anything? Put them around back then, they would be criticizing quantum physics from beginning to end. What a waste of resources. You're so smart, why are you wasting it on atoms? <laughs> it would take 40 years, 50 years, before quantum physics would become the very foundation of information technology. There is no creation, storage, or retrieval of information without an understanding of the quantum. Not only that, this obscure research paper that Einstein wrote on the stimulated emission of radiation, it would, that would take 40 years. 40 years later, the laser would be invented based on that principle. Oh, what do three of those letters stand for? The light amplification by the stimulated emission of radiation. Was Einstein thinking, barcodes, that's why I got this, or no. laser cosmetic peel. Mm -hmm. No, no. So, all I can tell you is, I don't know what the future will bring, but if you stop investing in basic research today, you won't have a future. Mm. So it's being worked on today. We should encourage it to be worked on today. And don't go up to a scientist and say, how does that re relate to me today, and how is that, the only right answer is, I have no idea. 
but evidence of the history of this exercise tells us that one day it will. So there are things that are hugely important to your life, and your, I mean the collective mm -hmm. you, that no one knows about yet. Correct. Correct. All that matters, if you're curious, is that you're exploring something you do not yet know. I'll give, can I give another example? I would love it. My, are you, my example's okay? Yeah. Are they working on the show? Yeah. <laughs> so far, so good. Because I don't want to be like, I don't want to. I'm just kind of absorbing it, so okay. feel free to okay. whatever you got. Usually you do all the talking. A lot of times I do, but that's scripted. That's a lot easier. Oh, really? Okay, okay. No, I'm not scripted. I'm just, I'm just blathering here. It works. All right. My physics professor in college, his name was Edward Purcell. Sounds like a nice guy. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he, it turns out he was a really nice guy. He did calculations that gave us ways to measure the existence and the depth and the composition of gas clouds in space. Did very important research. He also discovered a phenomenon, co-discovered a phenomenon where if you put an electromagnetic field across an atomic nucleus, okay. it will actually change that field according to the mass of the nucleus. There's a resonance between the light that passed across it and the nucleus itself. Okay. It was called nuclear magnetic resonance. Got the Nobel Prize for that. Afterwards, a clever medical engineer said, wait a minute, if you could put this field across and know the mass of the nucleus, and I can differentiate this nucleus from this nucleus, I can make a machine, put you in the machine, make images of all your nuclei. And thus was born the magnetic, magnetic resonance, resonance imaging, imaging, which used to have, and, but it's one of the N words that you're not supposed to use, nuclear. <laughs> mm. it's, you go into a machine that uses nuclear magnetic resonance. But the hospitals figured nobody wants to go in a machine that has nuclear on it. Don't. They, took, they dropped the N, yeah. dropped the N word, right. kept magnetic resonance imager, and it's arguably the most potent tool in the arsenal of the medical doctor to diagnose the condition of your body without cutting you open. That is based on a principle of physics discovered by a physicist who had no interest in medicine. So quantum physics, lasers, nuclear magnetic resonance, the list goes on. It, it go, you want another one? Yeah, we'll see one more. <laughs> okay. Do you know the laser alignment that connected the space shuttle to dock with the space station used a certain laser and programming technology that was then adapted for LASIK surgery, allowing the laser to align with your eye, even if your eye moves, so that the cut is always in the right place? So, so then you might say, well, why have an $18 billion agency just to invent grooves in a pavement? Okay, we should have the Transportation Safety Board invent this. But they didn't. Yeah. We should have other people invent it. But they didn't. This is my point. However complex or however simple, the germination of an idea does not always come because you legislated it. And in the agencies that you set up, make sure they're cross-pollinating pathways, without which people stay in their silos of thinking and no truly great discoveries would unfold. You can't necessarily decide to tell someone to get an idea or to do something better, but when a better idea or a really forward-thinking organization comes along and happens to do it really well, spread it, share it, enable it. Thanks for watching.